Hey everybody, welcome to my video on non-renewable resource allocation. Here's what we're going to be dealing with today. We're going to have two time periods. We're going to have an interest rate of about 4.14%. Number of time periods is 10, and that gives us an effective discount rate of two-thirds. Where did that come from? It came from this formula, which gives us our discount factor. See my video on net present value for details. So moving forward, we got a demand curve. Well, inverse demand curve, but same deal. There's our demand, there's our supply in equilibrium, set them equal to each other. You'll get a quantity of 60 and a price of 140. Uh, so here's what it looks like on a graph. This stuff should all be pretty review by now. Uh, so yeah, let's move forward. If I pick a given quantity, given by this red line, there's a gap between the demand price and the supply price. If I trace that gap out and find out how big it is, that's the gap between demand price and supply price, which can also be phrased as the gap between marginal benefits and marginal cost, which in this video we're going to call marginal net benefits. Net benefits being benefits minus costs, and we're comparing net benefits at the margin. Uh, so what marginal net benefits is giving us is the distance between the demand curve and the supply curve. And we're going to be doing a lot with this. So marginal net benefits then, marginal benefits minus marginal costs, demand price minus supply price, plug in both equations. The demand curve minus the supply curve, sorry, inverse demand minus inverse supply, and you're going to get 180 minus 3Q. Now notice... That is telling you how far apart the demand curve and supply curve are. When quantity is zero, you can look at the two intercepts, they're 180 units apart. And then if Q is 60, like in equilibrium, that number will go to zero. So if I graph this, there's a mar marginal net benefits curve. It has an intercept of 180 and 60. And you will see that that point 60 corresponds with the equilibrium in the static market. By the way, the equilibrium in that supply and demand graph is called the static equilibrium. Uh, but the 60 equilibrium in the static market will always be the intercept of the marginal net benefits curve, just because that's what it's set equal to. All right, so given all of that, I think we're ready to move forward if not, pause it and rewind it. Maybe work some of the math yourself. Uh, you can ignore everything above that line. That's just sort of built in. But I derive the marginal net benefits by subtracting the supply curve from the demand curve. And one thing I did not mention is that total surplus uh, in a lot of our models is the area between curves. Uh, in this case, we're going to use it some different words for it, but it's the same thing as total net benefits, or TNB. So these net benefits are basically the same thing as how much you would add to consumer and producer surplus put together. And total net benefits would be a measure of consumer and producer surplus. I don't know if that helps you either, but maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't, in which case go ahead and ignore it. All right, so let's move on then to something exciting. What if we have two time periods and we have a non-renewable resource? What do I mean by non-renewable? I mean there's going to be some fixed stock of it, say 100 units of the good, and once someone uses it, it is not there for anyone else. If we use it in period one, whatever we used is not there in period two. And let's say that, so that means that Q1 plus Q2 has to equal the stock of the variable. I guess I could say less than or equal to, but we're going to make it be equal to. Which means, let's remember our marginal net benefits curve for firm 1 is that, 180 minus 3Q1. Uh, not firm 1, I'm sorry. For people in period 1. Marginal net benefits for people in period 2. Same market, so 180 minus 3Q2. But we can substitute in from our resource constraint 
Q2 is equal to 100 minus Q1. I substituted that constraint into our net benefits equation, which gives us 3Q1 minus 120. So I've got marginal net benefits for period one and marginal net benefits for period two, both as functions of Q1, which really helps for graphing. But first I'm gonna get a present value for marginal net benefit two, which is the discount rate times the marginal net benefits. So two thirds times three Q1 minus 120 is two Q1 minus 80. So this present value of the marginal net benefits of firm two is there. Now notice on the horizontal axis, I've got Q1 and Q2 moving in opposite directions. Marginal net benefits for period one decrease as we go to the right, as we increase Q1. As we increase Q1, marginal net benefits in period two rise because they're being measured backwards. Uh, for period two, we've got zero on the far right and 100 on the far left. Uh, and so these are mirrors of each other. The only difference in the mirrors, we've put a present value sign on the MNB2 curve. So with all this in mind, how do we find the optimal allocation where uh, we get the most benefits for society across time periods. And we get that by setting the marginal net benefits in period one equals present value of MMB2, so 2Q1 minus 80. And that means 5Q1 is 260, which means Q1 is 52. Boom, we know the Q1 where that happens. Also, use our resource constraint, 100 minus Q1 is equal to Q2. So it's 100 minus 52 equals 48. And that's Q2. And so we know that given that we're discounting period two's well-being by a factor of two thirds, period one would optimally consume 52 units of the good, leaving 48 for period two. Since we discount their well-being, we take some of it in favor of our own, which is not discounted. So let's figure out total net benefits here. Let's see if we can show why this is optimal. If we are to measure total net benefits, it's gonna be area under the marginal net benefits curve. For period one, I'll mark it in blue. It's gonna look something like this. And for period two, which I'll mark in yellow, it's gonna look something like this. Now, what happens if uh, in period one, we decided to consume more? Uh, maybe we're thinking of our static model where the equilibrium value is 60, not 52. What if we consume all 60 like we're supposed to, and like we think we're supposed to in equilibrium? Well, if we do that, then all of this gets taken as total net benefits in period one, but that means that this area gets lost because firm two's net benefits don't kick in until that 60-40 line. So all of this stuff would be a deadweight loss. Uh, leaving only this chunk for, for for period two. Now I could do some calculations, like I could figure out the deadweight loss. For instance, if I wanted to calculate the area of that triangle, I would just need to find the height of it. I already have how far across it is on the bottom. I plug this quantity into my PV MNB curve. Why the 60? Well, it's because my present value of MNB is measured in terms of Q1. So two times 60 minus 80 equals 120 minus 80 is 40. So I know that this thing is 40. So I can calculate dead weight loss then times 60 minus 52. It's eight across the bottom times 40 
It's going to be 160. There is a loss in this market if in period one we behave according to an unregulated market, we will actually create a loss for society overall over time. Uh, in this regard, this is sometimes referred to as an externality in time. So I think that's all I'm gonna do for this video. Uh, it's getting long enough as it is. We've got this market failure. In my next video, the part two, I will show how to correct for this market failure, how to set a proper, uh, a correct tax on resource depletion. Uh, but for now, I think we're good to go. So hope it was helpful. If not, you know, it's too bad. But thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you next time. Everyone always says that, but I actually won't see you. But whatever. See you later.